Good evening, community. My name is Kelly Robinson, and I am your facilitator for the evening. And I want to, first of all, thank you for your time and attention and your interest in being present here uh, for this at the table. I want you to know that we have set the table and we have set this kitchen with all kinds of beautiful foods and all kinds of beautiful memories about food. So you're entering into this moment that we've created and we welcome you in. On behalf of Rubicon, Healthy Richmond, Mobility Labs and Richmond Community Foundation Connects, welcome to At The Table. Um, we will spend the next um, hour and a half in community and in conversation and in dialogue. Uh, first, I would like to welcome in our interpreter team for some information about um, an announcement about how folks need to engage um, with the interpretation. Sagrario, thank you. Buenas noches, queremos darles la bienvenida a las personas que hablan español. Se va a abrir un canal en español y tienen que ir hacia donde dice abajo en su en su pantalla donde dice español y ahí nos van a poder escuchar, van a poder hacer preguntas y nosotros vamos a facilitarles la comunicación con los presentadores. En un momento se va a ver en su pantalla para que vayan al canal de español. If you would like to send a question in, um, please send it to the speakers by clicking the Q&A button. Send a chat to the host if you are having any issues with interpretation or Zoom. And we have a number of folks that are behind the scenes working this evening to make sure that we will be able to uh, have the dialogue that we're having and also take care of those who wanna be a part of the dialogue. So make sure to let us know if, the, if there's any particular thing we need to do to make sure that you can be present for this evening. The first thing that we will do is we will be entertained. We have a performance this evening by uh, Jahim, otherwise known as Gio Jones, pronouns he, him. And I would like to introduce this fantastic uh, young man and uh, then let him do his performance for us. He is a graduating senior at John F. Kennedy High School and an active member of his community, of this community. He works in the field of social justice and youth leadership advocacy and grounds all of his work in restorative justice practices. Jahim also does poetry, performs poetry, as he writes in different styles over numerous different topics. He uses his poetry to heal, spread the word, and advocate for both himself and others within his community. Jahim plans to pursue higher education with the goals of becoming a doctor and improving the healthcare system to be more affordable, attainable, confidential, and most of all, safe. Community members, please join me in welcoming Jahim Gio Jones for his performance, poetry, spoken word. Jahim. Definitely, thank you for that. Um, again, my name is Gio, uh, and the poem that I'll be the poem that I'll be performing today is called Akebulan. Um, the poem is in lieu of Black History Month, which is the current month of February. Um, so yeah, you've told us to come home many times now, but our mother's backs grew achful, our father's feet sweltered in the heat. It's hard to leave home and return to confusion. It's no wonder they call you the motherland, and we're still in a conundrum that you are a country. We've been baptized into a lot that America hates us or loves us, but relentlessly they slaughter us. So how can we call ourselves African-American when America providedly hates us or what we thought America was or what American land should be? We're only tainted by the bodies we're only tainted by the bodies and smiles we throw on because behind it is a black mother crying for her lost baby a black man yearning for another day with his daughter, a black woman trying to put her purity back into life after being forced, another burden the black community has to live with. And we've been trying to go back home on a journey that was too much of a risk. We'd have to embark on another 400 some long mission back to where we were free. Home slowly went from kingdoms to plantations. It's hard to leave a nation you spent so long building. Hard to leave an economy we've had so much impact to hard to leave a society when we have so much engraved into it. We realized our purpose 
both black and beautiful and bold, whole and black, beautiful and whole, bold, and trying to re reallocate our own purpose in life. We realized that we have to bear land back. We're slowly trying to come home, learning to swim, regain our own trust and spirit. Have you even been listening? It's surprising to know that you still respond to Africa because everything, because like everything, they've even colonized your own name. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. And Gio, I'm just gonna let a few moments uh, linger there so that we can we can really absorb the fullness of what you just offered to us. <clears throat> From here, I'd like to introduce our speakers for the evening, welcome them. And then after I introduce them, I'm gonna open up with a question. And then from there, we will continue on with some of the other questions for the, the dialogue. And as new questions come in, um, we will be working with the uh, facilitators to make sure that those questions come in. <clears throat> Please join me in welcoming Tamisha Torres Walker, a dedicated community advocate and member of the City Council of Antioch for District 1. For the last 10 years, Tamisha has helped to change Contra Costa and her community towards making the right choices. She has used her community organizing skills to help coordinate community walks to prevent violence, impact major financial decisions in local government and state policy, advocate for the underrepresented and formerly incarcerated and engage the community in local elections, including the district attorney. She is also the executive director of the Safe Return Project, an internationally recognized nonprofit known for helping families and communities impacted by the criminal justice system, empower themselves to change their lives and reform criminal justice policies. Welcome to Misha Torres Walker. And I also just wanna say that it, for all of these speakers that are coming forward tonight, if I was truly doing their full bios, it would take me at least 25 minutes to read each of their individual bios. So this is a very small snapshot of who they are and a very small slice of the work that they're doing. Mr. Antonio Hernandez attended public schools in Antioch since kindergarten, and he was part of the first graduating class of Dozier Libby Medical High School in 2012. That year, he was recognized as the Youth of the Year for the city of Antioch. He went on to attend Stanford University where he graduated with a degree in economics. Currently, he works for the University of California, San Francisco as a quality improvement analyst in the pediatrics department at San Francisco General Hospital, the city safety net hospital, where he works on research projects that directly address the healthcare barriers faced by kids. He serves as the founder and director of the Dozier Libby Alumni Association, which created a mentorship program and $500 scholarship for graduating high school seniors. Antonio also works as a leadership and coaching fellow for Team TRI, where he works with student leaders all over the country to teach them the communication, teamwork, and leadership skills that students need. Welcome, Mr. Antonio Hernandez. Mr. Jonathan Bean is a black resident of Antioch and has been for the last seven years. He is a married father of five wonderful kids, four that are growing up in Contra Costa County. He holds three council seats in the county, Juvenile Justice Coordinating Council, Local Policy Council for Head Start and County Policy Council for Head Start. He has also been the president of male involvement for all Head Starts in Antioch, Pittsburgh for the last four years and recently joined the African-American Parent Advisory Committee in Antioch. Welcome, Mr. Jonathan Bean. 
Mr. Othery Christian is a Richmond native, graduate of John F. Kennedy High School, alum of Howard University, former juvenile justice case manager, youth minister, mm -hmm. and lead safety officer at El Cerrito High School. Christian earned his, Mr. Christian earned his bachelor's degree in criminal justice from Howard University. Othery has served as president of the Richmond NAACP, president of the Iron Triangle Neighborhood Council, member of the Richmond Recreation and Parks Commission, member of the Richmond Design Review Board, member of the El Cerrito High School Site Council, and advisor to the El Cerrito High School Black Student Union, and advisor to the Richmond NAACP Youth Council. Welcome, Mr. Othery Christian. Ms. Angela Dowell is a proud Verde Elementary School and Richmond High School alum and a third generation North Richmond resident where she was born into a life and family of community advocates. She is the niece of Denzel Dowell who was murdered by an officer from the Contra Costa County Sheriff's Department on April 1st, 1967. Denzel's case would go on to be featured in the Black Panther Party's first edition of its newspaper where they pointed at a number of inconsistencies in the case, including that he was unarmed. Growing up, Angela recalls pictures of her father talking to Huey Newton in rallies to fight systemic violence. Angela carries forward the legacy of a community that rallied together and looked out for one another through her continued involvement in decisions that affect North Richmond, her family, and most vulnerable populations. Welcome, Ms. Angela Dow. Esteemed panel, what an honor and a blessing it is for me to be here with you and to have the privilege of working on behalf of the community to connect with you so that we can learn from what you have to bring forward this evening. I'm actually gonna start with a question <clears throat> that takes you way back. And we're all gonna go way back with you. So go back in time to wherever it is when I read this question and just sit there for a moment and feel into that moment. When did you first know that this was gonna be your destiny? Think back to the moment or the moments when becoming who you are right now first begin to form in your heart. What was happening in your life at that time? Who or what was influencing you? And what do you remember about that time in your life? Maybe you always just knew or maybe somebody told you who you were or told you who you couldn't be and that formed it. Or maybe you were watching someone else in your community and said, I wanna be just like that person or in your family. So as our opening question this evening, tell us about that. When did you first know? Uh, Mr. Bean, would you like to start please? Sure. Um... I thought about this question a lot, actually, and I know exactly when I figured out that this was going to be my destiny. Um, I was about 14, and my grandmother was the secretary for the NAACP in Coffee County in a small town in Alabama, uh, where I was born and raised. And I began to follow her to churches, collecting donations for local resources. And I knew then that I wanted to get behind this. She pushed me into running for a youth and college chapter for the NAACP. I won, I was traveling around in Alabama, um, marching behind some of the greatest people who have had the, the opportunity to, to march the streets of Alabama, Selma and Mobile behind Martin Luther King and John Lewis. And um, I think that sparked something in me uh, that continues to burn now. 
So that that was the moment when I knew at a, at an early age of 14, um, standing in front of my community, um, putting on events for the youth. I knew that this is something that I wanted to pursue. Mm-hmm. Anybody just go ahead and jump on in. I, I could go. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, before I get started, I just want to pay recognition to the indigenous peoples of this land that we occupy, the Ohlone and Baywalk. Bay Miwok peoples um, here where I am in Antioch. I also want to say that um, if I knew North Richmond was showing up, I would have brought my A game. (laughs) And thank you so much, Angela, for holding space. I heard so much about your family's story and it's just amazing. I'm so, I'm full of like, my stomach is full of butterflies to just be able to meet you. you know, in person, it makes that history come to life. And I hope that more of our, our more young people get to like appreciate that kind of history that you bring in the flesh with you um, to this process. And so um, when, like, when did I know that like, this is where I will be today? I didn't. And that's just honest, like, you know, when you, when you grow up like I grew up, it was day to day, you know, it, it was even difficult to make friends because I didn't know where I was going to be living in the next 30 days or a week. And so every, everything was temporary um, and momentary. And I think um, the moment that I kind of knew that I needed to actually live was when I had my oldest son at 16. And, and, you know, it's a heavy burden to put on a child, but it gave me something to live for. And I was a child myself. And so I think like, just the sheer dedication to keeping him alive (laughs) and happy um, gave me something to live for. And I didn't know that I was going to be here today. Um, and, but I do now know what I'm called to do in the world. And I'm, and I just, I'm just so appreciative of like all the spiritual guidance around just allowing things to happen so that I could get a glory where it's supposed to be. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else on that question? Yeah, I can ask something here next. Um, I think it, it is hard to, to pinpoint the moment, and I think it really is um, a series of moments. Um, and I definitely didn't think I would be here quite this soon. Um, growing up in Antioch, something that I think about a lot is you know things that my classmates would say when thinking about what it means to be successful. Um, I think there was this idea that I'd hear over and over again that being successful in Antioch means that you left Antioch. And that didn't ever sit great with me. Um, I come from a, a low income background. My, my dad works as a dishwasher at Red Lobster and my mom works as a fried cook at Jack in the Box. And for us, the idea of leaving Antioch didn't even seem like a possibility. And um, So once I started um, college, I found myself running into all these different systems and barriers that challenge um, people of color as they go to these types of institutions, um, elite institutions. And I found myself wanting to return to that comfort of home. And so my sophomore year of college, um, over the summer, I, you know, got on my computer and I kept emailing our city council and um, all the staff in the city because I wanted to come back and uh, do an internship or do something in the city um, that summer. And so that's exactly what I did. And then I found myself after graduating, um, I just started showing up to city council meetings and showing up to the planning commission meetings and showing up to all these different things just to see and learn and see uh, what it's all about. Um, And I think just being there, um, you know, you, you kind of end up getting more involved and getting um, you know, seeing all the different voices in the community, seeing all the challenges. And I think this year in particular, 
uh, seeing the challenges with the global pandemic and the way that that's affected our students and students of color um, in our school district in particular. Um, I was a student that I, I, I honestly think it was a lot of luck that got me the right opportunities in the right places um, to reach some of these successful milestones in my life. But I just recall so many people that I went to school with who um, I think of them as so much smarter than I was, so much more capable. And because we didn't have the right supports and the right uh, pieces in place, um, that they might not have gotten the same opportunities that I did. And seeing the way that the pandemic was exacerbating that and seeing an opportunity to make a difference, um, that's really what kind of called me to action this year. Mm. Oh, three, would you like to join in there or Angela? Yes, I'll go next. Hello, everyone. My name is Othery Christian, and I am a native here of Richmond, California. Uh, grew up in the uh, central area. First, it was the south side. Then we moved to the central area like in 1980 um, and been in central ever since 1980. Uh, I attended Martin Luther King, Adams, Kennedy High School, um, graduated from Kennedy. Um, and the way I got started was through my auntie. Um, she, was a, she was a soldier in the community. Her name was uh, Lily Mae Jones. And she um, was an archivist in Richmond fighting for the equality of Richmond to help um, make our city a better city. And then she also loved to work with young people. And she, she was like an architect, uh, getting young people jobs. Um, and so I followed my auntie and, um, and I seen my auntie go to city council meetings. Um, and then one day she ran for city council of Richmond. And so um, myself and my cousins, we all helped her with a campaign. Um, just as a young man, um, growing up and just being around um, positive vibes um, where she gave me my inspiration to um, to help uh, fight for equality in, in the community to help make our community a better community and and my journey um, in 19 ugh, wow I think 1990 I, I went to Texas not Texas, but Washington, D.C. I went to Howard University. And, um, and when I went to Howard, uh, it was awakening for me, of uh, leaving out of my community uh, of Richmond, going to Howard University, where I experienced uh, the culture of a different kind of culture, where African-Americans out there were, were uh, doing a lot of great works. Um, and being at Howard University, historical black college, what gave me my, my a good strong foundation to um, build on um, and to begin to, to fight for, um, to help our young people um, and to see our community be a thriving community. So from, from Howard University, I ended up in the South and it's like a journey, but I ended up in the South. I went to Texas, I went to Dallas, and I went to ministry, uh, into the ministry. And from there, I ministry school. And then, um, and I didn't leave Dallas. I stayed in Dallas after I graduated. I stayed out that way and became a part of the city of Dallas and worked in the, uh, the juvenile probation department, uh, working with young people, helping our, the community of Dallas. And so many things I can say, um, but, the Lord brought me back to California, back to Richmond. And, and, the, and the way I ended back up here, my mom, um, you know, needed help. So I said, I'm coming back home. And I ended back up in Richmond. And, and that was my, uh, when I came back and, and then, you know, being from this city, it's like, wow, I, you know, I got to get busy. And so I've been busy in the community of Richmond since 2005, being on uh, 
neighborhood council president and um, and got involved in many other uh, uh, fights to improve our community. So um, my journey carried me a long ways and and my heart always wanted to make, you know, be in, in a position to be able to make to make a difference. And so this is where I'm at today. And mm -hmm. actually I'm on the school board. And and man, I just thank the Lord because it's it's through him that blessed blessed me to be where I'm at today. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and jump in there, Miss Angela. Good evening. Um, I'm Angela Dow, and uh, thank you, um, everyone, for allowing me an opportunity to share a story. Um, I am third generation Richmond, California, but I am very proud to say that my family, my family is um, from North Richmond. And a lot of people, it comes with stigmatism and things of that nature, but I'm very proud to say, you know, that that's from which I come. Um, I went to Verde Elementary School and it was there where I, uh, things started to shape for me. You know, I go into school where everybody looks like you and the teachers look like you and everyone is pulling for you and allowing you to be who you are um, just based on your history and based, based on from which you come. Um, my story when it comes to like just navigating through Richmond, I still am attached to Richmond. Even though I may not be in North Richmond today, I have a, nine, a grandmother who will be 91 next year if the Lord, I mean next month, if the Lord say the same. And so I was just there today. So I'm in and out of there every day. So I physically, if I don't sit there, my heart still sits there. Mm -hmm. And I, when it comes to being a change agent or an activist of sorts, it's just in me. Um, my dad would be so happy to be able to witness this moment for me. He just passed away. It'll be a month on March the 14th. And that was Carl Dow. And for all of just talking about um, police brutality, talking about activism, I just grew up hearing all the stories. I grew up with not even understanding why we had that bamboo chair that the kind that Huey sit behind and all these pictures up and not really un fully understanding them until I got old enough to know the, the richness of how that came about. Mm -hmm. And in that, I have always just been taught that I can be whoever I wanted to be and that, you know, to be proud of it. So when some people believe that because um, life has taken them to another place, they can't say where they're from or I'm from the Bay Area. No, I am from Richmond and North Richmond to be exact. Mm -hmm. um, and very proud of that. Um, that has, I think that that made the foundation for um, making me who I am. When you grow up, um, and I can relate to you, Ms. Tamisha on the, you know, when things are a little bit different and you can work yourself through that, it just makes you stronger. You know, it, it gives you the pride to know who you are. And I am who I am because of what I've been through and what I've seen. So. Um, I just started to organize. I've always been for the underdog because I don't know any anything else. You know, my my family, good or bad, you know, they they brought it for whomsoever police. You know, when they was talking about police brutality and losing my uncle, my dad used to tell me about stories of the interactions. How at one point in time they would ride around and police the police. You know, like I'm like wow. I mean, that's deep. He said, no, you know, when they got after someone, we was right behind them to make sure they did what they were supposed to do because they didn't want to have another situation that they had witnessed and had to deal with before. So fast forward, you know, I go off to school, I got my education and I'm still here and I don't want to be anywhere else. So I am proud to be a part of this panel. I am proud to be a Richmond resident and alum and um, I'm thankful for this opportunity and I thank you guys for having me. Thank you. So we're gonna, we're gonna talk about past, present and future. But before we move on to present, I still wanna keep us a little bit grounded in the past with this question. 
You know how we talk about sometimes I'm going to leave a legacy. I want to do what I'm doing to leave a legacy for the future. So this question is, who are you a legacy of? Who are you legacy of? Who or what? Can start again. Um, oh, that is, I'm looking at the chat. I'm like, that is a great question. Who am I a legacy of? Uh, and when I think of that, I think about like the product of your environment, right? Um, a lot of the things that um, I've been hearing from other panelists is like the things that we've been through made us who we are and we evolved um, out of those things. And I think that every person that I've come in contact with um, who inspired me to be the person that I am, I, I'm a legacy or a product of them uh, under that leadership. When I was under the leadership of my mother, learning how to take my first steps. And when I was under the leadership of the first organizer who showed me how to knock a door, um, all of those things I think made me who I am today, um, sharpened me, uh, to know the direction that I, I wanted to take in life um, and continue to inspire me, whether they are here in front of me physically or still spiritually inspire me. Uh, they continue to impact me uh, day after day. The people I've never came in contact with me, I think sometimes influence me the most. The, the words that I read, the videos that I watch, um, I continue to inherit all of that. And, um, and inspired by it every single day. So I, I think I'm a legacy of, of everything I've came in contact with. I am, um, I am like, this is a really tough question by the way. It's like, who, what legacy? Um, just because in the last 10 years, I've had to think about what kind of legacy I want to leave behind. What do, what is my mark going to be on the world as we want it to be? And, you know, I, I like to think that I am my ancestors' wildest dreams mm -hmm. and that um, I'm on a foundation, a legacy of hope and faith and um, hard work and being able to face as many challenges as possible, um, but be able to come out on the other side whole. Um, I come from a legacy of hustle. <laughs> if people don't know what that means, <laughs> then, you know, we could talk offline, <laughs> but like straight hustle, hard work alternatives and making sure that we take care of those who we love no matter what and that's that is the legacy that I continue to carry from my grandmother um, and I'm sure it was passed on to her by those who um, who loved her immensely and that and I say prayer because I'm sure that there had to be a whole generation of people praying for me to make it here today? Um, I think the first thing that comes to mind is uh, being a legacy of that story of immigrants. My parents were immigrants that came to this country that dreamed of, you know, giving us, a, uh, giving me and my siblings all the opportunities that they, that they could. Um, and in that, and in that thought, I, I think the other thing that came to mind is I, sometimes feel like I'm a legacy of everyone else who didn't make it because I understand that I've been privileged to be in spaces such as uh, attending institutions like Stanford and that for every one of me that exists, there was a lot of other people who could have been there, but because of the way that our system is structured, um, not everyone gets to make it. And so I think about all those people who played that role 
um, in helping get me here and in, in the responsibility that kind of comes with that of doing what I can to create more opportunities and expand that space for more people to be able to have access to those opportunities. So that's kind of the things that were coming to mind with this question. But I think like everyone else has been saying, man, this is a deeply challenging question. I can um, you know, add to, to the, the rest of the uh, information is that I'm a legacy and a voice of, of those who had encouraged me to never give up. I think of my mom, I think of my auntie, I think of many voices from the past and present will always tell you is don't allow yourself to um, lose sight of what you're trying to do. And, and many voices that has helped me to um, stay in the fight and, 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 and pursue your, to pursue your dreams. And so I stand here today uh, with the encouragement of many people who had told me, you have what it takes to make it. You just have to just do it and, and, and work hard at what you're doing. And so, so from, from the past to present, I think, um, I think many people who ha has helped me to get to help me to get to where I'm at uh, presently today. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I, I'll just chime in on what um, everyone else has said when you start talking about um, your legacy and your ancestors. I am um, who I am because of from which I come. And I come from um, a people who um, third generation um, Richmond, but who migrated here from the South just looking for a different life and to give their people and their kids a, just a different life. So my great grandmother um, came here and I think to Richmond in like 1950. And then she had eight children and they all migrated to Richmond from Prattville, Alabama. And, you know, I, we were just taught to be respectful, to want something, to be something, to just be proud people, even with little means. And it is so true when people say, you don't know what you don't have because you're so surrounded by so much love. We know we ate, but was it always, wasn't what somebody else would call, you know, a good meal. And, you know, at that point we didn't have much. So when we had our food and we got our one piece of chicken and something else we ate, we were full and that was enough, we were clothed and we were clean. So when, I, when you think about legacy and you think about ancestors, I just think about my great grandparents and, and my grandmother who all she wanted was for us to be safe and be someone. And, and you know, as she would say, don't embarrass me now. So to, to lead, to fall on that legacy and that ancestor is what meant a lot for her to preach you know, you need to own something. You need to have your own, you work hard. You know, it's, it gives you character and it gives you ethics. So I think that that all shapes kind of who you're going to be and who you are, just your life story. And it's sometimes it's read differently by others, but for me, it's, I, I wouldn't take anything from my story. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes me me. Nice. Uh, right before we came on tonight, my my light went out by me, so I'm losing a little bit of my light. So I want to ask you to focus on the light from within me, since I lost my external light. And I don't want to stop and readjust myself because I don't want to take too much attention away. So just know that I'm shining from inside, and, and I hope you will see that light. So so bringing, bringing it up a little bit to the present now. And I'm going to ask you to start to bottom line your answers with these questions so we can get a lot more in. Let's say the last 25 years to now, what's changed and what's stayed the same in the community, right? What's really different and what's really just the same in the community? 
25 years ago to now. Ms. Angela, will you start this time? I will. Um, I would say 25 years to now, what has changed is that I think 25 years ago, if I think about my community, I think it was, it, it, it there were proud people there. Um, um, there were homeowners, people who cared about their community, who cared about their children, who there was, it was more like a family. And I think that now with uh, a little bit of gentrification sneaking its head in the, and the community changing, I think that that's what makes it different for now. I, I, the, it's made up different, it's, it's changing, it has evolved where um, is the caring is not there. And that's the difference that I see for now. And 25 years ago, um, police brutality, and I think today is still police brutality. So those are the two things that in the community that I see some change and maybe not for the better. I think the, the story that I think about um, here in Antioch, my family moved here uh, probably roughly 25 years ago. Um, and it was a very different place uh, when we first arrived here. My, um, I remember my brother telling me about how when he had spent some time in Mexico, he was free to go around and walk around the neighborhood and do what he wanted. Uh, but when we came here, uh, this community was a lot less diverse than it is now. And there was a fear when it came to how my uh, mother kind of raised us. And she was very protective of uh of us, um, and so we were, we had less of that freedom. And I think as the community here has gotten more diverse, I think she's been able to get out of that comfort zone, and we've seen our own kind of uh, freedoms increase as we got older. Um, and but at that same time, over those years, I don't think that the policies and the attitudes and the different ways that we've approached the changing community um, have caught up with that. Nisha, will you will you speak next? Yeah, it's a it's a difficult question for me. I uh like 25 years ago, I can't even remember. Can't even remember what I was doing 25 years ago. Um, I can say that uh, you know, the difference that that I see, you know, in the context of the world. 25 years ago um, was a lot of people still attempted to take care of each other and provide, provide space and places to go for each other um, and tried to still hang on to the sense of community and even if you had a challenge, you know, uh, you still tried to hang on to your family. And so we still had community. And what I see different today is that we became hyper individualistic more so now than then. And it's very much about self and self-preservation and survival um, for self. And I think that's very devastating, especially to communities, um, BIPOC communities who are used to taking care of each other, but have now adopted these extreme culture of individualism. And it also prevents us from loving, protecting and taking care of one another like we used to. And I think that's what I kind of see. But I also see is people trying to retake that back take that power back and reestablish that community. Um, and I'm so grateful that that is happening, that that fire has been struck, especially during like a global pandemic. And black people have been in pandemics. <laughs> it's 
so I just want to be clear that like we we have had to overcome a lot um and um and we'll we will overcome this as well and what has not changed is a lot of what other folks have said well what hasn't changed is white supremacy patriarchy and capitalism and we need to address we we can only do so much. Um, but if we love, protect, and take care of one another, we can fight those systems. Mm. Yeah. Mr. Bean, how about you? What's changed? What's 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 the same? Um, I think the panelists all did a wonderful job of already addressing it. I would just only echo um some of the points that they mentioned. I, like walking down the street and if you had your pants sagging or you was cussing, someone said something to you, um, you respected that. You pulled your pants up and you stopped cursing, right? Um, that's, that's where I grew up 25 years ago. Um, it, it was that sense of community and we took care of each other um, in, a, in a way that, that made sense. It was loving, it was from a great place. Um, we were out. Um, we were out together uh, for all the right reasons, and yeah, that that definitely um, has changed. Um, you can walk down the street if you say something to these kids today. Um, yeah, you might be in for a rude awakening. It's it's definitely not the the sense of respect. And, and I think it comes from, you know, some generational curses that need to be broken and some, some systemic changes that, that need to be made. Um, but yeah, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm definitely not the one to point the finger or blame anyone um, for their shortcomings. But yeah, I, I just can't, I was cut from a different cloth and I, I grew up in the South and, and we definitely had a, a sense of respect. And I think that Tamisha hit it on the nail with what, what stays the same is like these structures, right? These systemic structures that have been oppressing people of color for centuries. Um, so that, 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 that is the same. Mm -hmm. Mr. Othery, what about you? What have yes. you seen that's the same? What's changed? Um, I just want to echo the same thing uh, as everybody else has mentioned so far as uh, the, the family. Uh, 25 years ago, families were more together and had more um, um, gatherings of connecting with one another. And the community n knew each other more versus now. Uh, it's a different time era. And I think we lost that, 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 that love, that, that connection um, and we basically, now we just, everybody's individually doing things on their own instead of us sometime, let, let's work together as a community, let's work together as a family. Um, and, and also now when I look, I, I'm just to say education, when, when I look at the disparities uh, in education, like in our community here in, in Richmond, how that equity is not a, a, a big playing field or, or our, our, our young people in the community or people of color getting a good quality of education. Um, I, I think it, it, it's still, even from the past to present that we're struggling. And, and, it's, and I think it's, it's purposely done that way to keep minorities from advancing um, and achieving their goals. So if you discourage uh, young men and young ladies out here, um, they will not be able to go to the next level. So, so systemic racism is, is, is well embedded here in our schools. It's well embedded here in our communities, well embedded in so many places. So that's still, that's affecting us and it's still the same. So in a moment, I'm gonna move you all into some community questions. But before I do that, I'm going to give you one more Kelly question with a challenge. We're about to go into the future. And, you know, some of us culturally, we can go past, present, and future. We can live in all kinds of different realms. And so this is not anything unknown to us. But I'm going to ask you this question. And then I want you to just pick one of these things and give me a quick bottom line about what you see in your um, 
in your ability to be a, a, a like a sort of a storyteller or a seer of the future of what you see. So we spent a little bit of time in the past, some in the present, and now I'm about to ask you to come with me into the future. It's 2031. Everything that you have worked for in collaboration in your community has happened. Everything you've dreamed of has come true. You're taking us on a tour of the community at this point. Point out one thing to us that's happening out there, what you're seeing, what we're hearing, what people are doing, what people have access to, what are the resources, what's the potential on that tour. Just pick one thing and point it out to us in this 2031 where everything that you've worked for has happened. Uh, Mr. Hernandez, would you go first? Yeah, it's definitely um, a challenging question. And I definitely think about it um, from the point of, of education was the first thing that came to mind. And I imagine, you know, walking through a neighborhood and seeing, um, you know, one of our students here in the district and being able to say, you know, what are you passionate about? What are you working on? And then having an excited answer and having something that gives them joy that they feel that they are in control over and that they're working on and that they, you know, they see school as a tool to help them continue to pursue those challenge uh, passions and pursue those things that they, that they love. Maybe it's, you know, sports, maybe it's, um, math, maybe it's robotics, who knows what kinds of different things, maybe it's art, um, whatever it is that they're passionate about. Um, and they see school not as this burden, but as a tool that they use to do the things that they care about. So I think if I had to quickly sum it up, you know, I'd love to see our students and our youth feeling that they have a greater sense of agency in their own lives. Mm. Mr. Christian, what is one thing, what is one thing that we will see on your tour in that community in 2031? Yes, and I had to sit here, I mean, sit here and just think for a minute. Um, what I'd like to see is that the young people that I help will be empowered to be business owners, um, to be in politics, um, to have a family, um, but that they're shaping their community for the community to be a vibrant, uh, strong community and that they care and that they pour their hearts into their community to see uh, their community thrive. And so that's what I'd like to see happen. Ms. Tamisha Torres Walker, what, what are we seeing on your tour? Oh man, I was just, um... So on my tour, I'm going to choose the Sycamore community in Antioch. And um, I hope Jonathan agree with me. <laughs> I'm taking y'all through the community, through the um, up Pepper Tree, up Lemon Tree. Seniors are out on their porches, waving to people, um, feeling safe. You smell all kind of good food in the air, kids outside playing, young girls playing double dutch, young young men hanging out, but also helping, helping our elders take their groceries in the house. And as you continue to move up the street, you see the barber, the barber shop is open and young people are getting their hair haircut and a lot of conversations is going on and everyone feels safe. The local liquor store is now no longer even selling liquor or tobacco products, but healthy food um, and, and, and other things that the community actually needs to get by. Young people are cutting grass um, and painting um, fences and helping keep the community clean. Um, and I think that's, that's what I see. And so I guess for me, in order to go forward, we have to go back. Ms. Dowell, what do you see in, in the community tour? When I think about um, a community tour, I think about 
a sense of respect. I see a community where um, there's more black businesses. Um, the pride has returned. There's no homelessness, um, no drugs. Um, everybody is just kind of prideful and happy. And to piggyback on what Tamisha said, you know, where you can sit on your porch because you don't have to worry about dodging any bullets or anything like that, where you're just safe and you're comfortable and you're, you're, you're happy. And as long as there's opportunity, it, it does create a sense of pride and it takes away those things that have plagued our communities for so long. So when I look at, when I look beyond, I'm just hoping that some of the things that are holding us back now, the systemic racism, uh, the um, giving us real opportunities and in, 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 in this world and on an even playing field so we can get what it is that we work for. Um, you don't have, and what we deserve because we will earn it. So if I can take that trip into the future, it would just be nice. It would be black and brown people getting along and everyone's just kind of respecting their own vibe and just, you know, just working families, just taking care of one another, just a sense of community of, of what it used to be. That's right. Hmm. Mr. Bean, what about your tour? What are we seeing? Well, Hopefully I'll be hand in hand with my council member over there on Sycamore, right? Um, I see a community garden right there on the corner. We got to talk about that, right? Um, black folks thriving, strong, people of color everywhere outside. Um, when I first moved here about seven years ago, I was able to play a game of football with some kids in the street. And I haven't did that since I was so, so young growing up in the South. And I want that back. I want not only, when I think about organizing in the community, it's not what you do. It's about recreating yourself to be able to do uh, multitudes of things, right? So it's a hundred now, Jonathan, 10 years from now, running around, bringing the community together. And, and, and that's what I would love to see is, is, is people um, inspired by the work that we're doing and want to continue that work from generations to come. That's right. So thank you for letting us be with you all on that past, present, future journey. In a moment, we're going to shift into some questions from the community. Some of these questions are for individual members of this panel, and some of them are for, for everyone to respond to. Um, please, Please do what's called bottom line your answers so we can get as much um, as many voices in the room as possible. We're gonna do this for about 20 minutes. Before we start, I wanna transition and I'd like to ask you to join me in taking your shoulders and lifting them as far up as you can to your ears and just letting yourself feel that stretch and then shifting them back behind you and feeling the stretch in your back and then pushing them down toward your feet. Getting some good stretch, opening up your chest so you can take some deeper breaths. And as we transition into welcoming community questions, I'd like for you to imagine that you are opening up your shoulders and actually touching the shoulders of the people on this panel, sitting next to each other. And that we are welcoming community members in and they are coming into the circle as well, into the table as well. And we're sitting shoulder to shoulder. So imagine that, that you now are in the room with our community and we're all sitting shoulder to shoulder. Imagine your shoulders opening up, going out, connecting with other folks that are coming into the room. The first question is a general question. So I'll read it. And then what I will do is just let whoever wants to respond, please go ahead. You don't, you know, if you want to pass on this question, okay. Just would like to ask to, to again, bottom line. This question comes from Rubicon Participant Advisory Board Member. I am a resident of East Contra Costa County, Antioch for 40 years. I've seen the community climate change vastly over the years with several positive opportunities. 
Along with that, there have been some difficulties, which include lack of cultural appreciation, lack of growth with systemic barriers surrounding housing, living wages, and a better awareness of policing practices. How do we encourage more community involvement opportunities to those who may be unaware that they even qualify to have a seat at the table? So if you thought my oh. questions were difficult. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'll go real quick and then I'll I can pass it off to Ant Antonio or Jonathan. Um, Thank you. I think um just to to sum up this question, um, everybody deserves a seat at the table. Um I think what we what we have to do is be the example. And when I say that is like, I, I didn't want to run for office. <laughs> I did not want to run um, for city council, um, but I wanted to be the change. I wanted to put myself out there, raise and increase the narrative and awareness of our people that we can create change. And we don't have to sit on the sidelines and watch while you know why we don't get what we need and i think that's what we need to instill is um hope and energy into our communities this like i'm i'm no different i'm not better educated or anything um i just had help and i had people surrounding me who are willing to throw resources behind my development and i think that's what we need is to invest in each other and in our leadership and that's how we get people to the table Yeah, one of the things that, 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 that came to mind, especially uh, the last part of that question was, you know, how do we get people that are unaware that they even have the opportunity to have a seat at the table? And, and like many things, I look at this through the lens of education in our school district. And sometimes it can be no wonder that some of these people feel like they don't have a place at the table when they've spent, you know, these 12, 13 years in school without having a say in how their education is conducted and how their curriculum was built and the, the, their everyday experiences. And so I think one of the ways that might be a, a powerful way uh, for people to know that they always have a seat at the table is to continue to uh, find ways um, to involve students in the decisions that are made on a school district level that uh, made in you know every single day of their lives as they're going through the education. You know, I envision how awesome would it be if you know education was something where you start your day and you ask the students, "What should we learn today?" Uh, you ask the students. Um, you know, what do we do when someone is late to class, um, when people feel like they have the opportunity to have a say in the different things that happens in their everyday lives by the time they graduate, of course, they'll feel that they have a say in what happens in their lives and they'll have a say and they'll want to continue to have that say in their lives. And I think um, so that's the thing that that came to mind immediately when I heard this question. Yeah, very quickly. Uh, I've been doing outreach for what, about 12 years now, and that's like boots on the ground, right? I'm talking about 30,000 doors between Alameda County and Contra Costa County. I physically have knocked myself. And that's how you get word out. You go out and you put the word out and you have conversations, meaningful conversations with people that inspire them to want to be the change, that see that um, there are opportunities if they um, engage and they show up and um, sometimes uh, they're not able to come to those resources. Sometimes you got to bring the resources to them. And I think that's the, the easiest way, but not the easiest way. Any other comments on that question? And I just want to um, I just want to read one chat that says, "You guys are so brilliant. You are making me cry with joy." Uh, just really quick, like culture. Just to the question of culture, it's very important to be seen and acknowledged. That's one of the reasons why I don't I I don't really like the term people of color. I say black people. 
I think that we have been invisibilized by this term people of color and any culture or history we have is stripped from us when that happens. And then our young people don't see themselves in murals. They don't see themselves representations of themselves, um, positive, you know, representations of themselves in the community and, um, and leaders in the community that represent them and in their classrooms and in local government. Um, and so, you know, I would love, you know, if the world was how I want to create it, if we had a culture center in Antioch where we could appreciate all of our diverse cultures and, and, and Black culture and bring our community together. But we can start with the mural project that is being proposed for the city and make sure that, um, you know, Black, Indigenous, people of color and, and Latinx communities, that we have representation in those projects. Uh, Mr. Christian, this is a question specifically for you. It's from Rubicon West County Participant Advisory Board members. Our communities are aware of the burden placed on teachers in our district when dealing with the complexities of serving our children in the classroom during this pandemic. Are there measures and supports in place to provide support to the educators that strive to provide optimal education to our community's children. Uh, thank you. Um, and that's an area that we are working on. Um, as the, as uh, we have new school board members that are in place and we, we are working together as a team and we recognize that we have to make sure that our teachers have the resources, making sure our teachers having all the things they need in order for them to perform and do well in their cla in classrooms. And so we're working very hard and I'm working very hard to communicate with the teachers. I will be meeting with my district, which I serve as district two. Um, I will be meeting with the teachers coming up uh, within March. I believe it's March the 3rd. Um, and I'm gonna uh, hear uh, the voices of the teachers, uh, what are their concerns and what are some of the things they want me to, to help them uh, achieve. And so I'm definitely there for our teachers and I'm definitely there for our young people. I'm definitely there for uh, making our district a better uh, school district. Thank you. Um, can anyone say more about the mural project and how folks can get involved? I was just gonna put something in the chat cause I didn't wanna take up too much too much time. But um, I, I will say that if we don't come to the table, our voices, it is important for these to be participatory processes where we even go out and paint the mural as community and build community. And so um, I'm gonna be pushing for that and I'll put inf my information in the chat. So if you wanna push for that too, we can definitely organize at the level of the city council to make sure it's a community driven process. Ms. Tamisha, this is a question from you from Rubicon PAB member. We have voted. Now we would like to roll up our sleeves and do the work with you. In what ways can our local community support you in your work as a new council member? This is a great question. Organize, <laughs> organize, mobilize, um, show up at the city council meetings right now, virtually and in 2030 when we come back in person. <laughs> no, just around. <laughs> but like, organize, mobilize, bring, bring your energy to the council meetings. Um, you know, everybody doesn't have to submit a public comment, but having your voice heard is important. Review the agenda, look at things on the agenda. If, if, you, if you don't understand things that are on the agenda, call me, your city council member, to have a conversation. Um, if there's nothing on the council that you want to speak to, but you just want to raise up the issue in the community, submit a public comment and just say how you feel. I think it helps me as a um, local official if I hear from you to be able 
to hear from you, but also receive support from you on the ground to make things happen. We have all all we need if we pull together. And I think that's that would help me um, greatly to be able to help us all create change, which is why um, I was excited when Jonathan said working alongside each other, because mm -hmm. um, that's what we're going to, that's what I'm going to be from you all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a question for everyone. Sometimes folks feel like they have to move mountains. They have to do these big, huge projects and that, that if they're not working on big, huge things, then it doesn't really matter. From each of you, bottom line, what is one small thing? And a couple of you have already started to talk about some things, showing up at, at, council, at meet, council meetings, speaking up. What's a small thing that you would say to the community, you can do this and make a big difference? Mr. Bean, can we start with you? Um, sure. What I what I always encourage people to do is um, find something that you're passionate about, um, something that is happening in your community, something that's happening in your neighborhood, something that's happening to your family, something that's impacting your day to day life, and make small steps, um, six small goals and small commitments this week i'm going to reach out to this city official next week if they don't say it, I'm, I'm reaching out to a county official next month i'm going to the state capitol start making small steps whether that's a phone call an email um a handwritten letter to um a city official um or if, if that's just having a few of your members of your uh, community come together and have a 30 minute meeting about what they wanna see change in the community. And y'all start from there, just writing down ideas could, could be a small step. Mm -hmm. Mr. Hernandez, how about you? Small thing that makes a big difference. Yeah, I think Jonathan really kind of touched on the, the point that I was thinking about is just have those conversations. I think that's a amazing place to start that process um, and, and to begin that journey is just, if you see that or problems going on, talk to your friends about it, talk to your neighbor about it, um, begin to have these conversations because often the case is that these conversations are the beginning steps to deciding to show up at council meetings, uh, to deciding to joining some of these community organizations. I think just um, being able to talk with each other and the people that you know in your life of what's affecting you can really get the ball rolling uh, in the long term. Mm -hmm. Ms. Dowell, anything uh, around that? What can people do? Little things that make a big difference. I think for me, I am on a, just even on a smaller scale, just getting involved, I was able to um, begin with the North Richmond leadership team just by being at an activity at the park. You know, I was walking by, they had um, signed up asking a few questions of just about the community. And from there, it intrigued me that someone was asking questions. And from that, I went to one meeting and from there to another meeting. And now we're, you know, working on quality of life and different things for the community. So I think it just starts with just a little bit of interest, uh, just a little bit of um, just taking the time. It doesn't have to be on the large scale. It doesn't have to be, um, it's just something small, just getting involved. Yes. Um, this is a question from uh, Ms. Tomasa Espinosa says, how can we do more to get, how can we, what can we do to get more participation for the community in all these issues that affect more families of color? If they need to worry more to survive and put money on the table and not being evicted, what can you propose to make it better? and bring more participation? Yeah, I, I will say it is really difficult to worry about, you know, the big world of things and ideas when you're just struggling to pay bills or put food on the table um, and you kind of hunker down in the day to day. And I, I would say that that's the way systematic oppressions works that's the way they keep that is the way capitalism keeps us from being from being able to get involved because as long as we're poor and struggling all we can do is think about how do we how do we feed and clothe ourselves and so 
I would say that, I mean, there are organizations. Find a local organization that is working on these issues. There are organizations working on eviction defense and eviction clinics and working on organizing for tenants' rights and, and organizing around getting resources to communities to make sure that you can um, put food on the table. Um, sometimes you have to fight while you're in the struggle to be able to, to get involved. And I know it could be challenging for people. One thing you could do is if you're a resident of any city is that you could reach, reach out to your city council and say, hey, you know you could use that CARE Act money that's coming from the federal government to help supplement rents so that people don't end up on the street. <laughs> you know that you could use some of that CARES Act money to develop a universal income <laughs> for residents <laughs> so that they can pay their bills. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, just try to get involved and then challenge us to think outside of the box and, and work for you so that you can work better in your community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I kind of want to jump in there and yes to absolutely everything that Tamisha said, um, as well as, uh, you know, I think one of the points that I'd like to quickly make is that um, also survival is enough. I think these systems are here in place to keep us down. And so um, just surviving every day and getting food on the table and doing these things is a revolutionary act in itself. Um, and when I really think about this question, you know, I think about that at the end of the day, if we lived in a perfect world, it shouldn't have to be on our community having to show up every single moment of every single day to make sure that people have rights and that people are able to um, live a, a life that, that they enjoy and that they're not suffering. Um, and I think, you know, more practically, one of the things that that I think uh, can have some of the biggest impact is making sure that we're electing people who have the needs of these communities in mind, who are thinking about those problems, who are thinking about these things and can take on that burden, take on that responsibility to so that you don't have to be thinking about this every single day as you're surviving. Um, so those are just some of my, my thoughts on mm -hmm. that, but it's such an important and such a big uh, topic. Yes, uh, we have a chat that says, I'm going to email every city council member on my city's website and demand that they get CARE Act money for rental assistance and basic income. So small action, big impact. Yeah. So in a moment, I'm going to um, ask you to think about a call to action. But before I do that, I'm going to bring it back to you again. And when I ask you this question, you're speaking for all of us because we're all human and this happens to all of us. So. And I'm going to ask you to give me a one word answer. <laughs> On the days and nights when you say, forget it, I can't do this anymore. It's not right for me. Who or what wakes you up the next morning and says, keep pushing? One word, one or two word answer, Mr. Bean. My community. Ms. Dowell. My ancestors. Mr. Hernandez. Equity. Ms. Tanisha Walker. My Lily, my Lily, my granddaughter, the next revolutionary leadership. <laughs> Mr. Christian. Yes, my community. So we're in a pivot to the call to action, the thing we always want to know from our elected officials, right? What's the most important to you? So in this year, 2021, what are the three things that are at the very top of your list that you hope people will get involved in? Three things that are at the very top of your list that you hope people will get involved in. And I'm going to give you about a minute to give your answer. Ms. Dahl, will you start, please? The three things that I hope people will get involved in is a community is one, involved in their community, um, involved in what's going on in the world and with um, Black uh, injustice, police reform, and just know your worth. Get involved with knowing 
who you are and what you can do to make it better. You are not where you come from. You can be who you want to be. So if people can just get involved in that way. Uh, Mr. Hernandez, three things. Yeah, I think the, the things that come to mind is um, equity from the point of demanding that data and conversations always be stratified. I think averages hide our community uh, very often. Um, I hope that people are involved in education and that people realize that uh, whether you have kids, whether you know young people, that um, having your voice in the education of your community is huge. Um, and then lastly, in community and having these conversations of the things that are happening around you and, and how can we improve the world around us? I think if, if we continue to have those conversations, they'll, they'll make their way to the right people. Mr. Christian, three things at the top of your list. Yes, uh, what comes to my mind is getting involved with the school district. Um, let's make some changes. Uh, let's see our school district um, improve in education to help our young people to go to the next level. I wanna see um, in our community, uh, uh, Richmond High and Kennedy High School have brand new schools. I'd like to see that happen, but it's gonna take the community uh, to help me um, push that to make that happen. Um, and then the third one is that let's help our young people uh, be mentors. Uh, let's encourage our young people to stay stay uh, in school. Don't become discouraged. We're in there to help you to go to the next level. Miss mm -hmm. Tanisha, what's at the top of your list? Three things. Yes, join my council member reimagining public safety advisory committee. I put my email in the chat and I can do it again. Um, it involves getting at the root cause of violence in our communities and read and justice reinvestment. Join that advisory committee and help support me to move those efforts on the ground. Um, gun violence prevention making sure that we address issues in our community that are specifically related with gun activity. Um, it, is, it is something that we, dire, we really need to address here in the city of Antioch to make our community safe. And, and um, the third and last thing that people can do is take care of yourself. Mr. Bean. Definitely our youth, I would say, it's top of the list. Definitely get involved. The younger, the better. Um, head Start, preschool, um, elementary schools, volunteer your time. Volunteer money if you have it. Volunteer food if you have it. Um, and thirdly, I would say uh, racial equality. Uh, when you see it, call it out. I would just like to read a couple of chats. Uh, survival is a revolutionary act when in war. It's the sad truth of our reality. And another one says, caring for ourselves is not self-indulgence. It is self-preservation. And that is an act of political warfare. And that's from Audre Lorde, a quote from Audre Lorde. As I offer my thanks to you this evening for allowing me to be with you in this space and to step into the service that is my passion and privilege, um, I would like to just invite back in the energy of our young, young man this afternoon, this evening that performed the poem, Geo, just to invite his energy back in. Um, would like to ask each of you just to give as you as we come to starting to come to a close and in a moment I'm going to toss it to my colleague Michelle Stewart but as we begin to come to a close if you could just if you could just say a word of what is in your heart right now Mr. Hernandez a word for us opportunity I think is the word that comes to mind Miss mm. Tanisha 
Revolution. Mr. Bean. Hope. Mr. Christian. Empowerment. And Ms. Dow. Okay. And I'm I'm holding legacy as my as my word. So again, I want to appreciate you for taking the time this evening uh, when we all know that there is so much calling at and tugging on all of us to be able to make a commitment to be anywhere in the world for an hour and a half is a big deal. So thank you for your time and for um, your commitment to us, the work you do, the community, and to yourselves and to legacy. And at this time, I will go ahead and invite Miss Michelle Stewart into the space to close us out this evening. Miss Michelle. Thank you so much, Kelly. Um, as she said, my name is Michelle Stewart and I'm with Rubicon Programs. And first, I want to thank Kelly for the excellent job of moderating this evening. Um, as we know, um, events like this don't go well unless someone keeps it moving and you kept it moving so well. Um, we'd also like to thank Jaheem Geo Jones for sharing the gift of his spoken word at the beginning that started us off. We'd like to thank our panelists Council member Tamisha Torres Walker, Antioch School District Board Trustee Antonio Hernandez, Richmond School District Board Trustee O3 Christian, and our community representatives Angela Dow and Jonathan Dean. And most importantly, we want to thank you for being here this evening. Like Kelly said, there are 101 other things that you could be doing for an hour and a half on a Thursday evening. So we really appreciate you being here with us. Um, that speaks volumes for your desire to be effective and become change agents in our community. You know, as we heard from our panelists, they were called to serve the community at early ages. But that doesn't mean that it's too late for you and me to be called to advocacy and leadership in the community. Remember, we all stand on the shoulders of those who came before us and we will leave a legacy of our own for those who come behind us like Jaheem. We have also heard from the panelists about opportunities to be leaders, change agents in the communities in which we live and work. Hopefully you have been inspired to step into these roles. It doesn't have to be great big leaps like running for political office. It can be baby steps like submitting public comments during council meetings, making phone calls or writing letters in support of policies that reflect your values. Remember, we all have a role to play no matter how big or small and it starts with you. I hope that you have been inspired like I have. My heart is full this evening. Once again, I would like to thank Kelly, Jaheem, Tamisha, Antonio, O3, Angela, and Jonathan, and you. Have a great night. Um, don't forget to check the chat if you need more information or would like um, additional information on how to become involved. I believe each of our panelists have put their contact information in the chat. You may also contact me and I will connect you with the panelists as well. All right, have a great night. Here's to change. <laughs>